Today we have Vera Karp and Louise Christie from the Master Gardeners. Vera became a Master Gardener in 2007. She continues to learn about gardening from other Master Gardeners and ongoing experimentation in her own garden. Her yard is filled with low water ornamental plants and lots of fruit trees. Louise has been a master gardener since 2011. She co-leads the public education team. Currently, she is helping master gardeners become savvy online presenters, like today. Her garden is a mix of vegetables, herbs, and blooming native pants, plants for pollinators. Okay. Vera? Good afternoon and thank you all for being here. It's a, it's a really great thing that we can all be together even if it's virtually. And so let's get started. Um, just a quick overview about Master Gardeners. Um, we're the Master Gardeners for Santa Clara County and we exist to help you become successful in your gardens to learn. Um, usually we would do these talks in person, but now through the wonders of technology, we get to do it together, but separately. Um, and, but that doesn't mean there's not more information for you. Uh, our website, which is mgsantaclara.ucanr.edu is, and you can do a search on Master Gardeners for Santa Clara County, has all kinds of information um, about gardening. There's also a help desk. If you have a specific question that you want to answer to, you can either email or and, um, we're starting to do these presentations online. Uh, we do have a YouTube channel, and if all goes well with recordings, we can, um, we'll put, put them online as well. And also, I encourage you to sign up for our monthly tips and events that you can do on the website. It's sent out once a month in the beginning of the month, and I actually still find it very helpful. They're all um, things that are specifically related to what's happening that time of year. So that's the basics. Um, just to get started, so you don't have to worry about uh, writing everything down, and this will, will be uh, given to you also in the end. There are some excellent resources, especially about uh, fruit trees. And one of them, which is uh, full of information, is the Backyard Orchard, United, University of California, uh, if you do a search on Backyard Orchard UC, it'll come up. Um, and then I also put the link, there's a specific area about pruning and training fruit trees that we're talking about. And another very, very powerful um, uh, website, also um, a University of California site, is the IPM or Integrated Pest Management. So we are not covering pests today but um, they do have a section that deals with specifically with fruit tree pests. So, Vera? The, yes, ma'am. <laughs> I just want to interrupt. I do think that we should explain to people that um, we were having a little bit of a glitch and we don't have the chat available. Uh, so we're going to take questions um, periodically during the talk and um, we will we'll ask you either to unmute yourself or depending on how crowded it gets, maybe just wave your hand so that we can call on you. Um, but unfortunately, we don't have chat available. Just, just wanted to let everybody know about that. Yes. You know, the joys of technical difficulties. But, um, but we're going to make it work. You'll get the information. And uh, hopefully, any questions you have answered. And if you don't get them answered, please uh, contact the help desk. And if you want to, you can reference that you were at the fruit tree talk. And this is a question about that. And you can even. If you put my name down, they might forward or call me too. So, um, or Louise, but the folks at the help desk also, they have the answer. If not, they'll find it. So one of the things I wanted to do first is to set the stage. We do live in the Valley of Heart's Delight. Um, sometimes it doesn't feel like this with all the computer companies, but um, there is some of the best soil on the planet for growing, uh, growing right here in our, in our area. We have a wonderful climate, um, but the one challenge is property itself is very expensive. So we have to make, optimize what we have um, to make the best of it. But just so you know, this is a view of what Silicon Valley used to look like. It was all orchards 
and in the springtime, it looks like it must have been spectacular. And a quote I like, um, managing fruit trees is far less complicated than we have led to, been led to believe. And you're going to hear a lot about pruning and uh, limbs and this and that. And it seems overwhelming, but at the end of the day, the trees want to work with you so that you can, you can be happy in their, in your, they can be happy in your yard and you can enjoy them. So we're giving you the knowledge, hopefully, that you can go forth and have fun and uh, prune your trees. So the question is, we're, the, this talk is about pruning your fruit trees in the summer. And why do you want to do that? Because um, traditionally, a lot of people have thought, no, you prune in the winter. Um, one of the things pruning uh, in the summer does, you can control your trees for, for uh, easier care. Um, when they're smaller, that means you don't have to, they're not, there's not as much tree to take care of. Uh, keeping the tree smaller um, makes the tree that's left stronger. Um, you don't have those extensive leaves that might, the limbs that might get heavy and break. Uh, you can, when you're pruning in the summer, you can see how the canopy is working and you can control how the sunlight uh, gets into the entire tree. You can regulate the fruit bearing um, and remove excess fruit wood. Now that might sound, oh, but I want to get so much fruit. Well, we can only eat so much um, and you want the fruit that does grow to be good. Uh, renewing the fruit wood keeps it rejuvenated and uh, more likely to, to um, fruit in the spring, uh, set fruit, and that fruit to be better. And also pruning in the summer helps you re remove the undesired wood it's certainly easy to see, easier to see what's broken or dead in the summer when the leaves are all on and you can see the ones that don't have leaves than it is in the winter. Um, and for me, you know, as I mature, uh, safety, I'm less inclined to climb a ladder. And uh, I have a small yard, so when I have a smaller tree, I can put more trees in. So that's why you would want to prune in the summer. Now, how does this work? What happens to the tree when you, when you take parts off of it? Um, basically, when you reduce the canopy or, or all the leaves and the, and the branches on parts of the tree, you're reducing the number of leaves available for photosynthesis. And that is how the tree makes food for itself and uh, gets energy so it can do what it does. Of course, when the tree has less energy, um, and less energy stored in the root system um, to be used in the summer and fall because you've pruned it now, um, that means that in the spring, uh, it's less likely to have as much vigor and certainly it's gonna be smaller, but it's gonna have less energy to get that much bigger. Um, and also it's more fun to prune now than it is when it's cold outside and raining except when it's too hot. Then I wait till the evening and it's very pleasant. Um, just to give you a little bit of, um, so you know where I'm coming from, this is my yard and from left to right um, is a, uh, there's a Fuyu persimmon back there. There is a um, pomegranate. Then in the middle is a um, mulberry and to the right is a baby, um, Arkansas black uh, apple. And I have, there have been other trees in there in the past that I've taken out over time because either they didn't grow well or something. So it's a, it's a constant. So most of those trees are actually still relatively young. Um, and as we continue to go around the, the yard, um, again, from left to right against the fence is a fig. Uh, next to that is an apple. Um, they might have been planted a little too close. I don't know, but I'm not going to move them. And then the one right in the middle is a Flavor King um, Pluot. And in the far right is a tent because I was tenting in place to see what that was like. There's a lot of critters that crawl around in your yard at night. That's what I learned. <laughs> um, and as you continue to go around um, the yard, uh, Again, in the left is that um, pluot. In the far left corner is a lemon. Um, 
which is starting to struggle because if you see way in the back, there's a, a large pine tree that is probably only 10 years old, but it, its roots are uh, impacting what's going on in my yard. Next to that is a mulberry, which is my new favorite. Um, in the middle is a baby, um, straight ahead is a baby peach. That's a red barren peach. And then on the arbor right in front is a um, passion fruit. And those are great. So um, as you can see, we can grow all kinds of stuff. And you can stick a lot of things in a small space because my yard is only 60 by 100, you know, the lot is 60 by 100. Um, but the only way I can do that is by pruning and keeping things small. This is the front. The fun still continues. That's the citrus. Um, I have, there are five trees and maybe those are a little too close too. Uh, one's a Mexican lime. There are a couple of um, uh, mandarins and then one caracara orange. And those also get heavy, um, quite heavy pruning to keep them small. Um, but, uh, and the only thing is you can prune those pretty much year round except kind of fall and winter where you don't want the new growth to get um, frost uh, or, or be more, more um, susceptible to disease. So that's where I come from. There's also, you didn't see an avocado and other things. Aren't we lucky we can grow all this stuff? It's just amazing. Um, and I thought this was funny, you know, we're talking about pruning and uh, there used to be quite the prune industry uh, around here. So um, there you see two labels that came from, uh, from the archives of History San Jose. And even back then, and I don't know what year these farm kiss, they're trying to appeal to kids with farmer prune, saying that kids would like prunes. Okay. So then to prune or not to prune and what happens uh, with both. If you do no pruning, uh, you're gonna get a big tree. Again, because we have such a great climate, um, it'll be beautiful, it'll have a lot of shade and it will take up a lot of space. And there's nothing wrong with having a big tree. It's just uh, that will limit what you can do. But the big trees uh, mean that you're gonna have a lot of fruit. And unless you can pick it all religiously, you're gonna end up with rats and squirrels, uh, messy sidewalks, smelly sidewalks, and they're difficult to pick. Um, and also a bigger, bigger tree means more leaves, more limbs, more to maintain if you can maintain it. Um, and of course there's gonna be more leaves that are falling and so on. So a big tree, is a big tree, it has a lot more to take care of. And here's a, a historical picture, but this could be any time today. I believe these are apricots and you can see um, they're on ladders. Uh, the title of the, the picture on the left was men and young and boys picking fruit. And uh, you know, they have a whole crew of people to pick the fruit that they're going to package. Um, then of course the lady on the left, I guess she's gonna throw her son up in the tree to, and let him do the picking. But if you look at scale, that's a lot to take care of. And it's way out of reach and you have to climb a ladder if you're gonna to get to it. Uh, now these are three trees on my immediate block. Um, and my little man is about to, to give you a sense of scale. There's a grapefruit, a fig, and an orange. And they're all beautiful trees. Um, they all provide some screening in between houses, but every single one of them uh, drops fruit. The owners do not pick it up religiously. It smells, it adds to rat, rats, um, and it's just a lot to take care of. Uh, so that's one of the consequences of just letting a tree go. They're both, they're all healthy. They all make great fruit. And I'm glad the big fruit fig tree is on, on my neighbor's yard because they're very happy they let me pick figs. So small is beautiful. Uh, a small tree is easier to, than a, uh, to take care of, less to prune, easier to get your fruit. You can control the amount of fruit. Um, 
and it's safer. And I know about controlling the amount of fruit. I, I used to think, oh, I want as much fruit as possible. But after you get about mm, seven or eight cases of peaches, which I did with a tree that got too big, um, I can only eat so much, can so much, give away so much, and then I get tired of peaches. Um, but there's something to be said for eating within the season because then I don't want peaches for the rest of the year. Um, now, you're going to see in the store, you're going to hear about different kinds of rootstock. Um, and most fruit trees are grafted onto a rootstock. Uh, different rootstocks have uh, different, uh, some are more disease resistant, like there are rootstocks that are uh, peach leaf curl resistant. Um, some of them claim to be semi-dwarf. They'll keep your tree, they might uh, keep the tree a little bit smaller, but it's still gonna get 10 to 15, if not 20 feet tall, even if it's a semi-dwarf. Um, sometimes you might see these super dwarf, uh, extreme dwarf, where you'll end up with a tree that's about I don't know, three or four feet tall or even less. Um, I've yet to hear of one that really gives any decent fruit. Um, so ultimately, the best way to control your tree size is by regular pruning. And if you keep at it, then it's not gonna to be too overwhelming. If you let it go, then you're gonna to have to catch up. And when you're making a choice about what kind of fruit tree, the first, the most important in my mind is, what do you like to eat? The second issue to keep in mind is chill hours. And that's the number of hours over the winter that are before, below 45 degrees. And when does the fruit ripen? So for instance, in my yard, I've got things that ripen in in um, the avocados are in mm, March or, or February. Um, citrus was already in January through, and then so on, then the apricots and then, uh, and so on. So I go around, around the year um, and uh, it's fun, it's good. So what are we doing when we're pr pruning? Um, we're controlling, guiding, or training the growth of your tree to, um, to accomplish all the things we've been talking about um, for form and aesthetics, for the tree health, to get more fruit and better quality fruit. So even at the same size, you can get uh, a better harvest from, from your tree. You can reduce disease, obviously controlling the size. And if you have one small tree, you might have room for another small tree. And it's on a more human scale, especially when you consider we don't have acres of land, uh, or certainly I don't, maybe some, some of you do, but um, here in Mountain View, land is at a premium. So a smaller tree is more in keeping and in scale with, with our, neighbor, with our smaller homes and neighborhoods and yards. So how does a tree grow? In the spring, new growth explodes, um, certainly for, with blooming, and it's using the energy that was stored in its roots from the previous season. And, you know, it's, it's springtime and the, and the uh, warmer days and more light. I put the trees in the mood to grow, but it, it's, it's part of its cycle. It wakes up and, and it starts growing. Um, so, and as it grows, it gets more leaves, more leaves, more photosynthesis, and that uh, is used by the tree to continue to grow, to have the fruit become ripe and, and uh, luscious, and also so that the tree can continue its, its growth cycle. Around summer solstice, which is the middle of June, about June 20th, um, that's the midpoint of the growth cycle. And it makes sense because that's the longest day of the year. And after that, the tree, the, the sun, uh, the days start getting a little bit uh, shorter. And the photosynthesis now is moving more towards storing that energy uh, in the roots so that it'll be able to survive for next year. So the cycle of fruit tree life. When you prune in the summer, uh, it reduces the number of leaves. Obviously, if you cut off a branch, there are leaves on the branch, and that means the tree will have less energy. Less energy stored is less vigorous growth. That's not a bad thing. That means it just won't ex 
have explosive growth, but it might have moderate, uh, a modest growth that will keep the tree smaller. Um, the other thing, apricots, you definitely want to prune in the summer. Um, they are uh, susceptible for getting diseases that um, spread throughout the tree during a rainy season. Uh, pruning in winter, again, not a bad thing, just has different, uh, different consequences of, of pruning in the winter. But I actually still go back and do some fine tuning. I might um, look at the structure uh, and say, well, you know, the tree isn't quite balanced right. Uh, it's easier to see the form. I can refine it. I can start training it to be a specific. And um, I certainly can then see, it's harder to see dead and diseased ones, but certainly disoriented if they're crossing, I can see that a little bit better in the winter. Um, occasionally, if a tree is kind of looking not as vigorous as I'd like it in the summer, I might not prune it and wait to prune in the, in the winter because I want the tree to get as much uh, energy as it can. Uh, if it's a little bit less vigorous than I'd like. Uh, some exceptions, and again, there's no right or wrong, but often persimmons are, are very tall, beautiful landscape trees. And uh, they, the one I have turns beautiful, a beautiful color in the, in the fall. Um, pomegranates, you can actually want to sometimes be more like a large shrub than an actual tree. Weeping plums, are bred specifically to have a, uh, a, a behavior where the, the branches come out and then arch back down to have, have that as a, as a landscape effect. And then um, there are multiple graft trees where they, they have uh, one major trunk and they'll graft different apples or so on. In general, I, I don't, I know it's, it's tempting to think that's gonna solve all your problems, um, but often, let's say in a multi-grafted apple tree, one variety or two varieties are going to be more vigorous and then take over than the other. And I, I actually had a multiple graft um, apple tree and the, you know, Granny Smith was nice and vigorous and the other guys uh, didn't quite get as much, uh, much nutrients as because the Granny Smith was taking it all up. So here's another thing that used to grow around here, pears. Um, and we ship those from all over the place. So uh, Louise, is there any, do we want to take a pause for any questions? Sure, I think that's a really good idea. Um, so uh, I know a lot of people have joined the meeting since we first said this, but we are having a little technical glitch and we don't have chat available. So what we'd like you to do is use the raise hand feature and you can do that if you click on the participants uh, item in your Zoom menu and then go to the bottom of the participants window, it will allow you to raise a hand. Um, and then we can call on you. We, I think we'll probably have lots of questions, so we may not be able to call on everybody. And then you can unmute yourself um, and ask your question. So I know um, Nalini has had a question for quite a while. Nalini, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? Yeah, I, it's not a question. I, I went and Googled why chat doesn't appear in Zoom and it said, go into meeting control and look, uh, look enable chat. And I don't know whether that's a solution or not, but I just wanted to say that. Thank you, Nalini. We have actually been trying that for the last um, hour. So okay. Okay. Yeah, we're, we're definitely exploring that, um, that option. Um, but thanks, thanks very much for that. How about David? Do you have a question? Yes. Uh, do you prune while still, the fruit tree is still bearing fruit? You can. Um, I tend not to. I mean, it depends on what time of, of um, when the fruit, when the tree is is fruiting. Um, so sometimes if you prune, you're going to give more light to the fruit, so it'll be able to ripen uh, a little better. Uh, but then you have to be careful, you're not going to knock any fruit off the, uh, off the branches. So uh, certainly on the apples and, and, and a, I have an Asian pear, uh, the ones, the, the shoots that go straight up, 
I might take some of those off and then later once the fruit is finished, fine tune the pruning. So the answer is either way is okay. Um, it depends what you're trying to accomplish. Yeah, I think for the apricots, um, I, I usually wait till, uh, they, they ripen in late May, early June and, and probably wait until like August or something to prune. Oh no, I would, I would do your apricot that one I would definitely do after it, um, after you pick the fruit, because you're gonna see, at least mine, a lot of very vigorous growth. And if your goal is to try and keep the tree smaller, you wanna pull that growth down sooner than later, so it has a little bit more time to kind of balance out and, and, uh, and it will put out a little bit more growth. Uh, but, but again, I, I do it after I pick the fruit. And um, Nalima has a question. I think we'll just take one more before we move on. Nalima, can you? Um, Hi. Unmute? Yes. Um, could I? Uh, I wanted to know what's the best time to prune uh, the, the plum tree. Right now. Uh, again, you know, as the previous question was, well, does do I do it with the fruit or without the fruit? Um, depending on if you've got a lot of upward growth that you can reach without disturbing the tree and it can, uh, disturbing the fruit and you can open it up and get more light for the fruit while, uh, you know, working towards slowing the growth down, that's okay. Again, I wouldn't, you might do a little bit now and then once you pick the fruit, do it's all gone. Tune. Oh, well then I would definitely go ahead and do it right now. Okay. Right now. Okay. That's the best time to do it is after the fruit is gone, do you think? Yes, especially if your fruit already, you know, you already picked the fruit and it, it's, it's uh, picked before in June or early July. Yes. Right. Especially if you're, okay. and, and if your goal is to keep the tree smaller, it would be, now would be a good time to prune. And what about in the winter? Is that not a good time to do it? Well, as I said earlier, you can, pruning in the winter is okay. It's just your, your, the characteristics the results of what happens when you prune in the winter versus pruning in the summer um, are different. Not one better than the other. So we're, we're going through that now. We'll go over it some more. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll, we'll try to get to more questions at the next break. So, okay. So keep going here. Now I have to figure out how to go for it. Okay. So let's spend a little bit of time choosing the fruit trees. Um, because what you put in the ground uh, and, and the decisions you make influence um, how, you, how you can maintain them. Uh, and there's one very important thing that we're going to discover about when you plant a fruit tree. Uh, so I don't know about you, but especially early on before I learned more, uh, I would say, oh, I just, that's a great fruit tree, or isn't it cute, or I like it, or the tree's on sale, or my neighbor has one, or, you know, oh, what the heck, I've got some space, I'll just put a tree in there, or, you know, the tree was here when I moved in. Um, so those are all, you know, I don't know about you, but you go to Costco and they've got all of those, those trees and they're a good deal. Well, you're better off taking your time because while it might be a good deal money-wise, you're talking about three, four, five-year investment before you get fruit. So uh, some of the things when thinking about what kind of tree to get, again, get fruit you like to eat. Um, and uh, now's a great time to try different things out at the farmer's market and, and write them down. What do you like? Uh, there's a lot of books that describe them. We all have our own um, preferences. I like yellow peaches um, and, and I like sometimes fruit that has a little tartness. Some people want really sweet and often on different um, websites they describe the flavor palette. Um, several things that influence the success of your tree, especially around here um, when we're getting uh, warmer and warmer uh, winters especially, is the number of chill hours. And again, that's the number of hours that are below 45 degrees uh, cumulative uh, over, our, over our winter. And normally uh, I see ah, 400, 500, 600. Um, you're starting 
borderline when you're getting a tree that says it needs 700 hours. Um, so, um, and the label on your tree will tell you. Uh, so it's really important to read the label. Um, the rootstock, uh, again, as we mentioned earlier, there are some that, that do help with uh, minor dwarfing. Um, others are, and, and you'll see again on the label where it talks about the characteristics. Uh, maybe this is good for peach leaf curl or other kinds of, of diseases that that particular variety is um, susceptible to. Another thing to keep in mind is pollination. Um, some trees are self-pollinating. What that means is that they will um, set fruit without having another tree uh, to cross-pollinate with. Um, but there are trees, sometimes it's Asian pears, cherries, some apples that need another tree, uh, another apple tree. Now, some of them can get by with another of the same apple tree. Sometimes you need an entirely different variety of apple tree, and it's important to do research and know uh, which uh, tree can be a pollinator for which other tree. And sometimes it has to do with what time uh, in the spring that each one of those blooms, because if they're not blooming at the same time, the bees can't go from one flower to the next to cross-pollinate. So that's another thing to really keep in mind. Um, environment, do you have a sunny spot? Fruit trees want sun. Um, our soil is great, um, uh, you know, this nice, rich clay soil, but you probably will need to add some compost to, uh, you know, increase the, um, the organic material. You do not need to add amendments. Our soil has more than enough energy, um, especially for a young tree. Uh, maybe as a tree gets older, you might want to fertilize it a little bit. And of course, water. Again, uh, research the varieties, walk around um, in your neighborhood, see, ask your friends or try and taste their fruit. And again, uh, I can't stress this enough, read the label and understand what it is you're, you're getting and what are the characteristics of the tree. The other thing is consider beauty, beauty. This is my little red barren peach, but isn't it cute? It's, it's, um, it's very, very pretty. Um, this was last year, but uh, I go, when I see it blooming, it's like, it makes me smile. Smell, um, I have a uh, kumquat in a pot uh, near my back door and it's blooming right now. And every time I go out the back door, I catch a whiff. So um, there are a lot of things that, that also are part of having a tree in your yard. So when you start out, if possible, um, get a bare root, well, a bare root tree. Uh, they're getting harder. Nurseries are less inclined to carry them, um, you, but you can uh, order them. And what happens is when they come in, the nursery will call you, you pick it up right as soon as possible and plant it right away. And that gets the roots that you see here directly in the ground right away. And it's, it's the best for starting out. Uh, many nurseries now, uh, because a bare root tree is more perishable, will pot it up right away. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. And you'll see the, the, them all in paper pots uh, in the nursery. And that, it's totally fine. Again, choose a variety of lot you like. If at all possible, plant it right away. Um, if it's raining um, heavily, you don't really want to plant it in super soggy soil. Uh, maybe dig the hole before you get home, before you pick up the tree. Cover it uh, in plastic if it's raining like crazy, and then plant the tree. Um, quality nursery, quality plant. They're going to they're going to order and make sure you you get a good plant. Um, do not put it in the lawn. Um, no amendments, but mulching over to keep moisture in, to keep the roots cooler in the summer and warmer in the winter can be helpful. And again, location. And the other one, room to grow. You're bringing this little baby tree home and it looks so cute. And you think, oh, I'll put it right here and maybe it'll look good. And you plant it two feet next to the house. 
or next to the fence. And next thing you know, in four years, it's this, it wants to be four feet wide and, and uh, it's banging up against the house or the fence. And um, so think in terms of, again, on the label, if you see how big it's going to get or you're going to keep it, keep that in mind and draw a circle in the ground about how big that's going to be. Um, just another thing to note, I've learned the hard way, um, fruit trees that are planted close to the fence line are easily accessible to squirrels and rats. So um, not that they won't come in your yard and get them if it's planted in the middle of the yard, but make it a little more difficult. This is what I was talking about. Uh, when you get that nice little tree, and it might be four feet tall with some nice pretty branches on the top, uh, all bare root, if you want to keep the tree small, you need to cut it about, to about knee high. Um, and what that does is it's going to force the branching out lower. Um, and this is, uh, helps getting the smaller form that we're looking for. So it, it will alter the form of the tree. It won't go up as much, but we want it to be lower. It creates a lower scaffolding, which then establishes a pattern of low limbs. And that's what we're looking for. That's the whole point of, of, of what we're talking about. And here is an example that Louise did. And it's, it's a superb example of just what we're talking about. There it was when it was planted. And you can see there's a there nice um, mulch out there, but it also gives you the sense of, you know, the area it's going to grow to. And then um, in June, she had, I don't know how long, the, they were about four, five feet long. These little, it was happy there, so it, it grew and it was very exuberant. Mm -hmm. And then she cut it and you think, oh my goodness, she did those nice heading cuts, but you can see the beautiful form it's taking and it's opening up. And then in July, just a month or a little bit longer, it's, it's continuing to branch out. So um, it's, it's done a great job to establish an initial structure for this tree um, to keep the branches lower and will help keeping the tree smaller. So, this is a perfect example of what I'm talking about. And, um, and I wish I had known this a long time ago when I put the trees in, because it's much easier to start here than it is to try and fix it later. Vera? Yes. I, I would just like to, since it's a little hard to see the scale in the pictures, I would just like to point out that, that um, the picture on the left, the top of that little stick is exactly at the height of my knee. That's where I had to cut it off. Just, just knee high, yes. Knee high. And you're how tall? <laughs> Five four. So there you go. So um, so it works, and it's it's uh, you won't kill the tree. In fact, you'll you'll make you you go a long way to to creating a very approachable uh, tree in a great scale. So we also grew apricots here. Um, and these were San Jose and Santa Clara, and they shipped them all over the place. Do you want to stop and take a couple questions? Um, yeah, why not? Anybody have a quick question? One? Sure. Sai is, Sai is the next one in line. Sai, well, can you unmute yourself and ask your question? <laughs> oh, well. Okay, I, we're having a little trouble getting to Sai. Hi. Oh, there we go. Hello. Uh, yeah, so my question back to earlier, uh, when it's talked about uh, a plant that grafted with multi, uh, multiple variety, and the note there say, uh, trim the upright one and trim the tip. And I was just wondering, uh, why is that? So you, because you have, again, you're talking about uh, how pruning on a multiple graft tree. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, a multiple graft tree will have one uh, trunk and they have grafted different varieties um, 
three, four, often sometimes five different varieties. And you need to be, you want to balance out um, the growth on them. So you're just trying to keep them all relatively even. Um, and they're gonna need, since each graft is just a little bit of tree, uh, you want to be more cautious about how much you prune them, especially in the beginning. Then uh, later you're going to be working towards everything we've talked about, creating a balance uh, in the shape of the tree and, and with the different varieties. Um, again, a multi-graft tree, one or more variety might be more, have more vigor as a variety or even their graft was better than, than the other varieties. So um, does that answer your question? Yeah, I, I get the idea that basically is try to balance them out. And I have Correct. one more question, but maybe you can uh, address at the end because I think a lot of people have the same question. What if I have a tree that's already too big? How can I we're, make we're, it? We're going to talk about game. that. Yes, we're talking about that. <laughs> okay, because thank you. Been there, done that. So yes. Yeah. Okay. okay uh, thank we'll, you. We'll Alice, going. Alice oh. would like to ask. Uh, we've got. We do have quite a few people. I think if we take a couple questions at each break, we can hopefully not end up with too long a line. Okay. Um, yes. Alice, would you like to ask your question? Yeah. So I uh, I converted my lawn to uh, orchard this January, and I planted about eighteen different fir fruit trees. I know it's a lot. Well, it's a big lawn, but. Um, I'm trying to keep it managed, so I'm really happy to hear into this is so timely for me because this, like you said, they start to grow up right quite a bit, and I unfortunately I didn't do the knee down thing, cut them down to knee knee high uh, at the beginning when I planted them in, in January. Um, so I, uh, I, what should I do now? I mean, I have. A ton of varieties, given the number of trees and um, um, reasonable distance, but not like too far apart. Maybe mm -hmm. it's six to seven feet apart from each tree, and I want to just keep them dwarf, like really manageable. Well, that's that's exactly what we're talking about. You're going to have to work really diligently and get to be great friends with all your trees. Um, and I'm jealous. Aren't you lucky? Uh, I would, uh, it's a balance between the trees needing energy because they're babies, um, but also trying to uh, force them to uh, bring more growth lower down. Um, so you're gonna have to experiment um, with the different trees and uh, work towards keep, keeping them lower. Yeah, no, I understand I, that's the balance will be tricky because I'm a really new gardener. And where can I get more information like to um, know each type of fruit tree? Because I don't want to accidentally kill one. Um, are you asking about for each tree or you just, um, so I gave you the, in the beginning, there's the um, University of California Backyard Orchard website. And that is a superb resource, and they have a specific section on pruning. Uh, so that's where you can start. And, uh, and so it's you. It's UC. Which UC? Sorry, I missed the beginning. So you just do, do a search on UC Backyard Orchard, and you'll okay. come up to that website. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Should we another question? Or can we move on. Let's, let's, let's move along. Okay. All righty. So as you can see, our Valley of Hearts Delight, that's what it used to look like with all those apricot trees blooming. And now it looks like different. So let's get into the pruning basics. What do we do? Um, first, a matter of looking at tree anatomy. Uh, don't stress over this, but a couple of key things to look for, uh, especially good starting points. Um, on the bottom, uh, I don't know how many of you have seen these little things coming out of the bottom. Those are um, suckers. You want to cut those out um, and even dig out to, to cut them at the roots. As you can see in the, in the image, they're, they're actually growing out from the roots. And those will uh, detract from the nutrients of the tree and you, 
you don't want them putting energy into that. You want them putting energy in the tree you're trying to shape. Um, the other thing, just moving up the trunk a little bit to the right, uh, similar water sprouts, which are these uh, tall, upward, uh, often vigorous growth. You want to you want to cut those off directly where they um, attach to the branch that they're on, and um, again, that will um, affect the structure of your tree. You're trying to, um, and we'll get into tree shapes, but um, so you want to remove those. Uh, another thing on the diagram are cross branches that cross over. Um, those you're going to want to look to remove. Going up the trunk, you see a little thing called a stub. That might be a prune you made a year ago, and now uh, there's it's it's not fully back towards the the trunk. Now those stubs often die, uh, die. Um, so you have a little piece of dead wood, and it's an avenue for disease to get into your tree. So we're looking at the other, the other things about um, the diagram. There are new wood, lateral branches, the crown, um, primary scaffolding. This is, these are just uh, uh, words to describe various structures of the tree. Um, so you can start building an, a vocabulary, but the most important is to develop your eye with your tree and decide what kind of shape you want it to have. So there's several different types of, of training or to think about when, you, when you're pruning your trees and shaping them because your prunes can affect, do affect the overall shape of the tree. Um, and here you have A was the tree when it went in the ground and B was the tree shortly after when it was cut off to knee high. So in the middle um, illustration, there the tree is growing. Um, in one season. And in D, you can see that many of the limbs that were taking the center, especially that, that very vigorous one, tall one in the middle, were taken out so that there's a more of a bowl-like shape to the overall tree so that more of the tree from the inside can get sun. Um, so that, that is called open center training. Uh, another form of training is central leading leader training. Often this is for apples, um, but you can train apples the other way as well. Uh, that's where you're encouraging one central uh, uh, stock, oh, not the right word, but anyway, um, to become the, um, the main and then sh shaping the roots to come out of that and, uh, and you can see that actually in, in the illustration for C and D, that they're using uh, spacers or scaffolding to actually pull the branches out so that they're more open, so that they too can get enough light. And you continue to do this, and as you can see with the illustration, the dotted lines are things that were taken out. And each thing that was taken out infl influences the, uh, the how the rest of the tree reacts and grows based on that. Fruit bush training. Um, this one's very appropriate for what we're talking about as well. Um, that's where you're, um, again, similar to the open, you're, you keep pulling the, the tree back overall over time until you reach, and gradually until it reaches the height you want, and then you just keep pruning it uh, around to that height um, and, and keeping it small or keeping it to the size you want. And, you know, on the notes it says vigorous trees may require pruning one or two or more times during the season. So it's okay. You don't have to do it all at once. You might do a little bit in June and a little July and a little fine tuning in August. And sometimes that's easier than trying to do it all at once. Uh, and, and fix everything. Espalier. Um, this is easier than you'd think. Um, basically, it means, uh, you know, in this case, the, the diagram shows uh, two posts with wires across. And usually that's, uh, it can be any height, but often it's four or five feet so that you can keep it. And what you do is you take branches that are naturally uh, moving in one direction 
uh, and tie them to the wire and while cutting off other branches that might be moving in another direction. And then as the trunk goes up, you pull another two over to the side and so on. And then you see all of the um, uh, growth going straight up. Those you would start pruning off in the middle of the summer to maintain the shape. And it can be a very um, effective way if you have a uh, space between yours and a neighbor's, you can put it uh, between two or you can put it along beside your house or along the fence. So moving right along, when you're pruning, it's pretty basic. There's two types of cuts and each cut uh, can have uh, different effects onto, the, onto how the tree grows. One is called a pruning cut and you can see how that is the cut is almost all the way against the, the primary branch. And then uh, a heading cut or a stubbing cut is when you're cutting in the middle of the growth and uh, cutting it straight across, uh, or even at an angle, but you can see that, the, um, that it's, it's reducing the length, not the overall branch itself. Uh, one important thing, especially on a larger cut, is the branch collar. And you can see in the illustration what that is. Um, you wanna make sure not to cut, and in the illustration it shows the branch bark ridge, you want to cut a little bit out because the branch collar uh, forms a barrier for the trunk of the tree um, to uh, that it heals over better and reduces the chances of, of that cut getting diseased. So uh, looking at tools, one of the most important things when you're pruning is keeping your tools clean and sharp. Um, sharp tools mean that you have better cuts. Clean tools means that you do not spread diseases. So um, we'll have a little bit of a show and tell where I can show you the kind of tools I have. And, uh, and we can talk a little bit more about that. So I am going to stop sharing. That's the theory. Of course, you need your chapeau. Protect from the sun so you don't get sunscreen, sunstroke, all that. Um, and gloves. I have a variety of different gloves. There's regular little gloves. And I also have long gloves. I found um, over time, I've gotten more sensitive to getting pokes. Um, so I uh, have these. Also good for when you're pruning roses. But um, you can, they help protect your, your hands. One other thing I found, and these are for um, these are for bike riders, but they're very handy if you are um, for sun protection and also to protect you from pokies, technical term pokies. But um, so that's that. Uh, okay, pruners, and I will have to say, having gardened for a while, I have a fair number of them. Uh, and they're different varieties. Um, so this, this is the general tool of choice. Oops, sorry. Um, and for, that I use for most of the cuts I'm making. These ones have a little bit of uh, uh, pointier, uh, sorry, I'm looking at the camera. Uh, and they're probably better for thinning fruit or picking your fruit or more fine tuning. Um, so, and in terms of brands, I have uh, three. One of these is a Corona, which is a, a basic brand, works perfectly well. Um, I won Felco's in a contest, so I'm very happy about that. One thing if you're gonna, Felco's come in different um, sizes. I have smaller hands. Uh, these are a uh, Felco six, so make sure you, you check. Um, on those. And then this brand, this is probably the one I use the most. This brand is Baco. I can't say that. Um, but for me, again, uh, it fits my hand best. So do some research. Uh, find the ones that work for you. Uh, these you might need to get online. 
Many of the better uh, nurseries in the area have Felcos. Um, so you can ask a friend if they can show you theirs. Another really important tool is a uh, saw. And probably between the uh, pruners and the saw, these will be your main tools to use, that and your compost bin. But um, this is a folding saw. And for most of what you do, this will be fine. If you really need to cut something, I got this thing. Um, and you just have to keep cutting, but uh, it does a pretty good job. But again, overkill. Now, you might be tempted to get loppers. And, you know, you can chop, chop. The problem with these is, is they can tear as opposed to cut. Or, you, you know, depending on how you're, you're cutting. Uh, so I tend to actually use these to chop up the branches that I'm putting in my, my bin. Uh, but uh, they should be lower on the totem pole of things you use. Other things I have in my arsenal are sharpening tools. This is one I got on sale, um, Zenport. Uh, it's, it's got a little more fancy. This is just a straight uh, sharpening um, stick. So, that's the next extremely important thing you do. And whenever you're going to start uh, pruning a tree, always, always clean your tools. And um, I use, I still have this, I bought this before, before all the uh, problems. And if you can't find a cleaner, a uh, bathroom cleaner or whatever, you can use uh, one part bleach to 10 parts water. But basically what you're doing is trying to, is, is removing any diseases that might be lingering from another prune you did. And so basically it's, it's you know, cleaning them and you clean the whole thing. Take care of your tools and they'll take care of you. Um, for this one, it has a nifty difty guide and it says, well, um, just do this. And you're, you're looking to sharpen, and you can see one side's angled and one side's flat. With the, with the little stick, um, I just gradually run, whoops, run the tool over it that way. Don't need to do that many times, maybe uh, four or five, uh, especially if you keep them uh, sharp uh, a lot, you know, frequent as you use them. So, um, that's all you need to do, but it, it makes a huge difference, believe me. And, and you don't have to push as hard because your tool's sharp, so it'll go through the branch much faster. Um, so that's, oh, the other thing, when you're um, finished and if your tools are getting, uh, if the hinge is getting a little stiff, a little bit of oil, you can use WD-40. This happens to be machine oil. And you just put a little bit right in the um, joint and it'll loosen it right up. Again, keeps the, it keeps the tools, because uh, these are pretty good investments. I mean, they're, they're not inexpensive, and, uh, but they make a huge difference about your ability to, to, uh, to prune successfully. So that's tools. I think I'm going to go back to the presentation, if I can do this without, uh, there we go. And up, up, now. I might need, oh, there we go. Did you know we used to grow grapefruit around here too? Um, you wouldn't think it, because they'd think that grapefruit needs more heat. Uh, but made in the USA and by Santa, and it was packed by the San Jose fruit packing. And I love this one because the bears and the eagles are fighting like crazy over that can. It looks kind of ferocious. So if, if you were, I don't know, on the East Coast and you got this can of fruit from California, you'd wonder what kind of, what kind of fruit we grow. Okay, uh, any questions about tools? Let's, um, let's take the next person in line. Um, specifically, um, if you have a question about tools, now's a good time, but I'd also like to take people in, in order of their question. Um, and then we'll, we'll have time for Q&A afterwards also. But Nita, would you like to ask your question? 
Hi, thank you for the session. Um, I don't have a specific tool question. Um, I do tend to use loppers, so that was a really great comment, and I'll keep that in mind because I find that it tears also. But I don't have a saw, so I've been just working with the loppers. But, um, you know, um, pruning fruit trees has been just a notorious problem for me. Finding people to help me because initially I didn't know what to do. It was really hard. And what I've gone through is I've lost a really great fig tree. Um, I, I, my, uh, my plulot tree has been just going through torture. I haven't had fruit. I had like a few fruit this year, but I've, for the past three, four years, I haven't had any fruit. It got infested with a bug, which infested the fig tree. And as I said, I lost that fig tree. But it, it just finding and figuring out how to grow mature, like prune mature trees has been really, really hard. Um, and the plula tree is one of my questions. The fruit I got ha looked great from the bottom, and I only got a handful this year. But when you pull it from the, pull it out, it was all mess, it was all um, bad on the top. And they were open, they, they were cracking open. And I found that with my peaches too. Um, so I have a small, like three-year-old mature, uh, three-year-old young peach tree, and the peaches were cracked and open. Um, I dealt with uh, another illness there with that peach curl initially, which I pulled out. Um, so, Nita, Nita, do you have a do you have a specific question? Yeah. So the fig tree. So I have these new fig trees. It's a young trees. Um, the fig tree doesn't have any didn't get any fruit. I initially cut it in spring. I pruned it in spring because I thought I had to. And so can I, oh, you, so you can me, prune it in the summer. Can I prune it now instead I'm, of I'm waiting? Hearing, for, I'm hearing a theme. You've got a lot of little trees. Um, young trees in general, you may not get fruit or you want, you want the tree to spend most of its youth, certainly its first three or four years, putting energy and developing the tree itself. Um, okay. Uh, so, so don't prune them. Well, prune them to shape them, prune them to keep them smaller, but also pull the fruit off. Um, and your fruit splitting, I don't know how much you're watering. That might be uh, a symptom of why the fruit is splitting. Um, okay. So, uh, so, okay. That's so that. I, I didn't, when they went, they were bare root, I didn't cut them to the knee high but they're, they're growing kind of weird. And so I'm trying to kind of contain them. So as I, I hear you say that they're, they're getting, they're establishing just so trim, prune them to keep their shape or how I want to shape them. And then that's it, but I can prune them in the summer. Yes, yeah. that's what we're talking about. So um, Louise, it's, it's two, so I wanna keep, keep okay, moving let's on. Move, I don't let's wanna. Move on. So, um, and we're gonna, we're gonna be talking about shaping next. So that's um, getting started. What do you do? We've talked, a couple of people have mentioned, what do I do with my trees now? Um, if you don't know what to do, the first thing to do is get rid of any diseased branches that are crossing, uh, any, anything that's dead. Um, and also, as we mentioned earlier, those suckers and water sprouts. One thing to keep in mind, especially if you have apples or pears or Asian pears, is fire blight. And that's what fire blight looks like you'll have a branch dying off. If you see that, um, cut not only the dead part out or the diseased part, but actually at least six inches uh, or towards, towards as far down as you can towards where the branch is attached to another branch um, because that, is, that disease, uh, fire blight, uh, can spread. Also make sure you keep your tools very, very clean. Um, so again, dead disease. So this is my um, pluot. And as you can see, I have a lot of these little um, things that die from year to year. It's fine. I don't worry about it. And everywhere you see the red, um, I, I will cut those off. Um, one thing is uh, practice good hygiene. Any of these branches, put them in your um, toter bin. Don't put them in your, uh, in your compost bin. Um, if they are diseased, you don't want to keep it in your yard. Uh, compost, the city compost tends to, to get a lot hotter than we can get and kills a lot of the diseases. On the right hand side, you're seeing um, a prune that I did a year or two earlier. And you can see that the branch that was coming out there didn't grow. It died back. 
So again, that red line is where I'll prune it, but keeping in mind, as we talked earlier, the branch collar so, so that it'll heal properly. Um, pruning cuts. There are thinning cuts and heading cuts, as we talked up about later. Remember, thinning cuts are the ones where you're taking the branch all the way back down to where it is attached to another branch. Um, so you're opening up the, the tree for, uh, you're opening up the branch or that area for light. You're removing weak branches and you're controlling the growth. So if you look at the picture on the right, uh, I'll definitely be moving, uh, removing that middle uh, branch that comes out and maybe fine tuning a little bit more. Uh, heading cuts, that's where you cut straight across, uh, well, at an angle, but in the middle of the branch. And um, prune to the outside buds. So what does that mean? The little buds that are on the tree, um, based on where you prune, that's gonna encourage the buds to put out a new branch. So this cut was on, a, on my, um, Mulberry was made mm, maybe a month ago. And as you can see, the new shoot is now growing where the bud was. And I wanted that growth to go out to the side. So that's where I cut. Um, so again, heading cuts uh, bring the branch down, but also uh, are key to controlling the direction the tree grows. Another thing, this is a tough one I had to learn the hard way, is thinning your fruit. Do it. It makes a huge difference. Um, years ago, I used to let my peach tree do what that top picture is showing you. Um, and I got a lot of fruit. It was all little. It was okay. Um, but once I started thinning, the quality of my fruit improved dramatically. The tree put its energy into making better fruit than a lot of fruit. And the rule of thumb is six inches, as you can see in the bottom picture. So um, it's also important for the tree health. The other thing that happens is if you have that much fruit and as they all ripen, they're going to get heavier and heavier. And eventually that branch could break and you lose everything. Um, so less taxing on the tree which means fewer diseases and pests, make sure you have no fruit touching. Um, because, especially with, with apples and pears, but all of them, I have seen this continually. You see where those two on the left-hand picture are touching and you can see there's a webby thing behind? That's a critter in there and it's getting inside the fruit that I, that I thinned out. Um, if you let the tree, the fruit continue to grow, you will get worms or different diseases um, where the fruit touches. Uh, so again, you can have two diseased fruits or, or lousy fruits or one really good one. Another hot topic, what do you do? I don't know about you, but you know, a lot of critters think they need to share what I grow. And the only way you can really um, protect your fruit is to uh, a physical barrier. And that's either netting your tree. Uh, I have actually uh, individually wrapped my, those are little wedding favor bags, got them on Amazon. Um, and since you have a small fruit tree and you're trying to grow uh, a fewer but better fruit, it's doable. You know, you go out, uh, Couple of, a couple of nights and, and bag a few uh, every, every evening and eventually you'll get all your fruit bagged up. Okay, now we're gonna have a show and tell on pruning. So, I have my nifty difty um, sample here. Let's see, there it is. My apricot donated uh, a big chunk but it needed to go anyway. So here you have, let's see where I've got, there we go. Um, pretend this is a limb off your tree because it was a limb off of my tree. And, and you can see we've got a lot of this growth coming out all the way here. We've got stuff growing every which way. You've got all of this stuff. You can see here was a 
prune that I did um, last year. Can you see that one? Uh, whoops, sorry. Um, and, and then that shaped the, the direction of it there. Um, I'm looking at, we've got something growing this way, we've got one here, we've got one here, so something's got to go. And I don't know. It's really complicated. All you do is you take your pruners and let's say this is the outward facing part of the tree. This is where it's going out. So this is going inside. So I might start with this because these are too close there. And then I want to open that up. And are you seeing this? Um, and maybe this goes away. So these are thinning cuts. I'm thinning it. So now it's a lot more open. Okay. But look how much it grew. So it's long. That's, that's I don't know, four feet long. So I'm going to make it shorter. This is a heading cut. Now you can see here, well, hopefully you can see, there are, you know, left, right, left, towards me, away from me. So these are all the different ways the leaves are going. I want this one to go out to the left. So I'm going to prune. Oops, I'm going to get rid of the leaf so you can see. So again, we are, I don't know, this demo might be harder to do than I thought. So I want this to go to the left. So I'm going to prune it this way. I'm doing a little bit of an angle. So now when the tree grows, it'll grow that way. That's actually to our right, but it's very clear. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So, so there you go. So poor guy, but look, so now he's happy. There's a lot less tree. Um, I'm going to keep moving along. This one needs to head off too. And again, on this one, you can see it's actually making a lot of little limbs. So I might decide I want it to go, or this limb is going this way. Ta-da. That's it. Now it's more manageable. Ta-da. Well, it's not going anywhere. It's going into the bin. But um, it's not complicated. You can do it. <laughs> okay. Meaning that we're, we're kind of moving on time. I'm going to keep going. So you can do it. It's totally okay. Okay. So even though this looks like a lot of stuff in my backyard, you just take it one tree at a time and eventually you'll get through it. Or you get mad and you just give up and all that. So apples. And in fact, um, in Watsonville, they're growing more and more apples, a lot of organic apples. And uh, so these were from Watsonville. I don't know when that was. I'm going to keep moving along because I, I don't want to, I think we, we're going to run out of time. So now what? You know the tools to use, you know the basic cuts to take, um, and then you're probably sitting there as a lot of questions said, I've got 18 trees, what do I do? Or that, take your time, just breathe. Look at the tree and pick one. Don't worry about all 18, just pick one. And um, look at it. I go out actually and it's very pleasant, especially now when we're all staying home. I go out and, and look at the the tree with my morning tea. I don't drink coffee. And look at it in the evening. Um, look around and see uh, in your neighborhood what's working, what's not working. Um, is the tree too tall? Is it fuller on one side? Are the branches crossing? And then think about, do you want to keep the tree small? Do you want it to be more like a shrub? Do you want it to be uh, have one central uh, leader going up? So those are things to, uh, to do is your, but take your time looking and thinking. Don't just jump right in. So looking at a tree, what do you look at? Um, here is a three-year-old, this was a um, candy cot. And there's my dog, so you get a sense of scale, Nora Bell. She likes the trees because she likes to eat all the fruit herself. <laughs> um, but there you can see, they just let that tree go. They planted it and there it went. Um, and then, so what do you do? You look at that. So the good news is they did pull it down. They did prune it down probably to about eight feet. 
but you can see four years later, they're still letting it go. So it's crazy. So it's, it became still another overwhelming um, thing to worry about. Whereas if they had uh, in 2016 taken the time to pull it back, consider it, it would be much easier. It'd be less overwhelming. That tree actually, when we were walking by last month when the fruit was ripe, lots of that fruit was on the ground. Norbell was happy, but it was rotting. And what good is that? So here's in my backyard, this was a nectarine. Um, you can see the shape of it before and the shape of it after. And I pulled back about a third, maybe a half. Um, and this is exactly what I'm talking about. You pull it back that much, it's fine. You know, the tree was healthy. Um, I did this probably in uh, July. Um, so that gives you a sense. Here's uh, this year, my, um, my apricot. It grows like crazy, um, especially this was uh, June. And I really have to bring it back hard. Otherwise it gets totally out of control. And you're also seeing that it's wide. Um, and that's what I wanted. That means there's more fruit lower. I could bring the side branches in if I wanted, but it makes shade for my nice little chair where I contemplate the universe. Um, also, you can't see in this photo, but I did open a lot more inside the tree. And um, so there'll be more sun coming in the middle of the tree. Uh, in terms of training, you know, we talked about espalier, but there are other ways you can use training. This is a little apple tree in front and um, the stick I, I tied lightly with string, one of the branches that was going straight up so that the form would be more uniform. Each one of those branches is going around. Uh, they, it looks lopsided, but it's not. Um, so they're all ar clockwise around the uh, spread out circular. So you can, if there's a branch not going the way you want it, especially while it's younger, you can say, would you please go this way and then tie it to a stick? And it'll agree. Um, <clears throat> this is an Asian pear um, that I'm doing my version of espaliering on. And uh, this June, you can see all of those little pink lines. That was the growth. It's shooting up, growing like crazy. And so I cut down almost all of those, except for two that I trained uh, one to the left and one to the right uh, to continue my, my own more loose espalier. <clears throat> I did not put posts. Those are uh, wooden sticks I had from other pruning. Uh, it doesn't, again, you don't have to be super fancy. I happen to like things that are a little more casual. If you wanted it more formal, you can go ahead and, and put the wire and the, and the posts and train it more, more uh, uh, rigor uh, with greater control. Again, no more right or wrong. It's just what, what works for your garden, your aesthetic. And cherries, um, Mount Hamilton cherries. There's actually in Morgan Hill, uh, a few cherry orchards that, that, uh, um, that are trying all kinds of different fruit. I think we've been, again, because the weather's been getting warmer, um, I've had a harder time having cherries set, um, but there are some varieties that, that do take less chill hours. Um, Louise, I'm gonna keep going, okay? Now, uh, making corrections. Now here's the one thing, you can't put it back on, you know? It's done, it's off. I can put it in a, a bowl for, for decoration in the house, but it's, I can't glue it back on the tree. So obviously it's better to, to start small, make a few smaller prunes, look at the tree, um, and then do your best. And, uh, and you can fine tune it in the winter when you can see the shape a little bit better without the limb, without the leaves. Also think in terms of years. We're on the tree schedule, not our schedule. And trees um, have, have a different, they're not gonna do immediately what you want them to do. It's take, gonna take time, sometimes several years. You learn by doing, so get out there doing, but also keep in mind pruning is an art. Um, and 
uh, somebody mentioned hiring somebody. It is hard to find a good, good pruning, uh, fruit tree pruning person. You're going to pay a lot, which is why it, it, it behooves you to kind of learn to do it yourself. But if you do choose to hire somebody, make sure they focus on fruit trees. Um, I think you mentioned you had a fruit tree that died after the pruning. Um, one of my neighbors lost an absolutely gorgeous avocado because they totally hacked it in the height of summer and it just killed the tree. So we don't want that to happen. So take time to learn to do it. Um, get to know the tree. Don't be too aggressive and you'll be fine. Now, <clears throat> what if your tree is already big? Again, don't just jump right in and whack at it. Um, you, there's a good chance you will um, put the tree in shock or in the case of the avocado I just mentioned, if you prune off too much, uh, parts of the tree could get sunburned. Sunburn can lead to disease. Disease can kill the tree. So again, think in terms of tree, tree time, uh, plant it over a three-year period where you're bringing it down a third every season and to the size you want. Obviously, it's much easier to start small, um, but uh, you know, start by thinning the upright shoots uh, and then gradually sew off the limbs a little below where you want the first third to go. And little by little, think in terms of the tree is going to need nutrients. Um, don't cut off too much, otherwise it won't have enough energy to fight disease. And if the, if your, the limbs that you just pruned are exposed to the hot sun, you can paint them um, with some uh, latex water soluble paint one to one. But, uh, you know, it's better to just be considerate about what you're pruning so that, that there is some leaf cover. But also sometimes, depending on the tree, it might be better just to take it out altogether. Um, because radical pruning can destroy the form. Is the tree old and diseased? Uh, and ultimately, is the tree so big that you'll never be able to get it small enough to make it truly manageable? And strawberries, of course, our friends in Watsonville. Um, aren't we lucky we can grow, all this stuff grows here. Obviously, they do it commercially, but we certainly can do it in our backyards. Okay, what to do now? After this talk, you're going to go outside and look at your trees and say, oh no, what do I do? I got 18 of them. Where do I start? First of all, do you like the trees that you have? What do you want them to do in your yard? Um, are they healthy? Are they big? Can I get at the fruit? When does the fruit ripen? Um, also, sometimes certain trees um, have, maybe it was Maybe it was a, a family tree, or maybe it's a variety that, that you can't really find anymore and is more, uh, you want to save it. So that's totally legit as well. So the question is, do you keep and manage the existing trees, or do you remove and replace, or a little bit of both? <clears throat> Plan what you're trying to do. Again, look at the tree's overall form and how do you want it to shape it? Do you want to have an open form? Do you want to have a central leader? Um, opening up the middle to let in more sunlight. If the tree is still moderately sized, pick a height and work to get to that height and don't let it get any taller. So you're going to have to be religious about doing it every year or it could get away from you. And you decide the height of the tree. Again, remember earlier we said, um, the best way to control a tree's size is by pruning. And if you're the pruner, it's up to you. <clears throat> Again, if you don't know what to do, starting point, dead, dying, or diseased, uh, the sprouts. And while you're doing that, you're starting to get to know the tree. You're starting to see how it's growing and um, understanding a little bit more the form of that tree from the inside out, not just from the outside. I'll look for branches that are growing or rubbing against each other. Um, that could bring in um, uh, disease. Multiple leaders, those are uh, branches. You might have two going straight up and vying for dominance. Um, pick one. Uh, again, you're looking at the overall shape of, of how the tree is going to grow and develop. 
And then nuisance growth. Uh, we live in an area that has power lines, sidewalks, buildings. Um, I have a fire hydrant on my property, so I have to make sure that the orange tree uh, is away from the, from the hydrant so that, heaven forbid, they need to get to it, the fire department can. Um, visibility and so on. Other thing to consider, um, how does the, sh the tree fit in my landscape? Uh, is it, do I want it to be a, is it in the front yard? Um, do I want to be, have it, do I like the bloom in the spring? Um, what overall shape do I want? Uh, how do I maintain that tree's health? And an example of this, this is a, a mulberry and uh, one year, in one year it grew with those two um, branches going straight up. I thought, well, cool, I'll, I'll let them go straight up and cross them and I'll make a, a nice circle and it'll be interesting. But it, it got too big, too tall, too funky looking. So I did two very strong heading cuts. And uh, those are both about three feet tall because I, I decided I want it to be more a shrub type of shape. Um, and the tree was the tree was young enough and it, it wants to be a shrub. So it was okay But keep in mind that This year because that the cut was done last year this year You can see all the multiple things branching that's coming out of that Cut and I need I need to go back in and thin those out because you don't want a whole bunch of little spiddly things coming out of the end of the end of that cut, you need to thin them to let a few become stronger. When considering a new fruit tree, um, plan for putting the tree in the, in the winter. Don't get tempted to put one in now, um, even if it's on sale. Um, the, you just um, making it more difficult for the tree to thrive. Um, Again, research the varieties you like. Um, make sure you have a location. Make sure you, does it have a pollinator? When does, does the fruit ripen? Again, those are all things we talked about earlier. And, you know, spend some time with your garden. Uh, especially now, we all need uh, sanctuary. Um, your garden wants you to be there, um, wants to give you peace and, and joy. And, um, and do that and find a place to just sit or walk around. Um, so I, if you can see the fountain in the, in the far back there, every morning uh, the hummingbirds fight to have a bath there and it's, it's just great. Um, and I look at, oops, what's getting too big or not just my fruit trees. Um, so it brings me great joy, especially right now. So, and I love these labels, this was fun. Uh, Santa Clara Valley extra fancy pirate pears, I guess, but they're ship shaped. So you summer prune your fruit trees to have a ship shaped yard, right? And in conclusion, yes, we're getting towards the end. Um, consider the role of the fruit, cre fruit tree in your garden. It's both uh, food to eat and an aesthetic tree in your yard. Um, review the trees that you have. Um, and what you have for them, uh, any goals for new trees. And ultimately what we're talking about today is using summer pruning to manage their size um, so that they fit better in your landscape, um, so that you get better quality fruit, so that the tree is healthier and looks beautiful in your yard. So uh, resources, um, again, I mentioned that California Backyard Orchard uh, and excellent website an excellent website the next one down is also on that website um, and it has information about pruning although i'm realizing that link is for oregon state but probably also a good source for for information but again the california backyard orchard um, does have a pruning site uh, pruning area uh, dave wilson I'm not recommending any particular tree uh, uh, tree grower, but he their website is superb. They do not sell trees directly; they sell them to to nurseries. But all kinds of different varieties, descriptions of those varieties, pruning videos. Um, I highly recommend spending some quality time. They have a nice chart that maps out um, 
what time different fruit uh, trees are ripe. Um, trees of antiquity, another interesting uh, supplier of fruit trees. Uh, another resource, California rare fruit growers. We've been talking about kind of the standard trees, but you can grow a lot of all kinds of interesting, interesting trees. Um, and they, they're the source for information on that and other things, um, and also the basics. And there is a very good Santa Clara County chapter as well. And of course, um, the book I mentioned earlier, Grow a Little Fruit Tree by Ann Ralph. She talks about more about the philosophy of why you want your tree to be small, um, basically talking a lot about what we, we just talked about. So that can be you in your apple tree. And again, those are all images from History San Jose. You can go to their website uh, and learn more about San Jose and our, and our history, of which fruit plays a big part. So enjoy. 